So there we go. Well, I think we're going to start. We're about two minutes in already here, and I got some stuff I want to discuss. So, uh, yeah, my name is Curtis DeGore. I work as the, the Borgo agronomist here at uh, in St. Brew. And me, along with a, a team of, of Jeff Strukoff, as on the right hand side here, another agronomist, and, and, and Al Lefebvre. So, uh, you know, this is who's doing the trials we're going to talk about and who's running the farm. But uh, before we get too much further, we'd just like to, again, welcome you, everybody, for, for logging in and really appreciate you spending an hour here. And we'll try to get through some information. And again, if you go on to that chat, I'm watching it. So if something doesn't make sense, uh, please feel free to, to, to put it online there and I'll, I'll read it quick. And if it's a question I can answer quickly, otherwise we'll get to the end and we'll do some, we'll do some, try, or some uh, question and answer afterwards. So. Great, we're up to about 60 people here now. All right, so again, my name's Curtis, that's Al. And uh, yeah, we run, a, we run a farm here at, at Borgo and we got about 2,400 acres. And you can see our equipment is, uh, you know, this is a new to us sprayer, nice sprayer. That's our, that's our treater. So this is the kind of, the farm we're running is very, uh, very much, don't have a blank check, that's for sure. So we get to play around with a lot of stuff. Um, one thing that we do get to play with, obviously, is some is some newer air drills, and uh, so there's me just loading her up, and you know we're out there we're out there seeding. So there's a real passion here for for farming, for agronomy in general. Um, yeah, so I'm excited to kind of show you some of the trials that we've been playing with uh, as well. Here's a shot just of our vineyard and our dryer, and we got the plant in the back. So if anyone's been here on a on a tour before, you'll probably have jumped into that plant, and that's where the moving floor is. And there's just another shot where we're literally farming right up to the right up to the factory. So when we we're saying we're farming in St. Brew or right around the factory, it's it's literal. So there's us combining right next to the right next to the plant. Uh, we do get to play around with some other things uh, as well. Uh, this is you know maybe call it R&D, but you know a Harrow bar we put a, a broadcast kit on it in front of our leading tank that we're playing with, and you know we're able to then start to play with. Well, broadcasting fertilizer, but then what about variable rate uh, Avidex and uh, or variable rate chemicals and and you know what can we do with that? So that's the kind of farm that we have going. But what I want to really talk about you guys today is uh, is our trials. So if anyone was here this past summer, uh, you may recognize this. This is where we had our our seeding is believing day, and we would have driven you out on this nice, well beaten path out here to take a look at the at our trials. And so this is this is 2020 canola. And, the, and for anyone who's, who's not familiar with what, we're, with what we're doing here, is we set up kind of larger scale trials. So these are actually 400 feet long by 30 feet wide. And we replicate everything three times so that we get a little bit more uh, confidence in, in that the treatment is causing effect and not just from random, uh, just random, you know, in the soil. We, we, we can base a little confidence on this. So there'd be a block here, let's say, of treatments and a block here and a block here. And all, all they're, they're replicated three times, they're just randomized throughout. And you can see that there's differences out there. Uh, our wheat trials as well, this is from 2020, you can see there's some big differences. And again, there's the 30 feet wide by 400 feet long. And again replicated in, in different areas of the field to get that to get the results that we're going to go through here today so around st brew these trials are all around st brew uh, our, our land here is a dark gray turnism it's got about 5.1 percent organic matter so pretty good in that sense pretty good ph 7.2 uh, we've got okay nitrogen 30 pounds nine pounds of foss so that's 4.5 ppm so that's pretty low you know we're into single digits there uh, Potassium as well, uh, it's 250 pounds, 125 ppm. Uh, again, is, is pretty low for Saskatchewan in general uh, and, and definitely on the lower side. Uh, sulfur about 30 pounds, but sulfur is kind of a uh, up in the air thing when it comes to soil tests. Anyway, uh, our equipment that we're using is a leading 7550 cart for the trials here. And then we have multiple units that we can hook in behind so what's really nice about this is we get to use the same metering system and everything the same except for just the drill that we're plugging into the back uh, as far as different placements go. So we get to do a lot of different comparisons uh, and, and in, in the same field and we can get away with that with 30 on 30 feet and it allows us to replicate. So it's kind of a nice combination between large scale and smaller scale trials. Uh, 
uh, when it comes to harvest, uh, what we do is we take the middle 25 feet here in the swath. Uh, we're using, large, again, larger scale equipment. The combine goes into the way wagon. Jeff grabs a sample out of every single strip, send that away to the elevator. In wheat, we're looking at moisture, dockage, and protein. And in canola, we're looking at uh, moisture and dockage. And then we zero all this out. Uh, so we're very, very, uh, I guess, confident in the results that we're getting. Uh, we do lots of reps. We, we look at a lot of different factors in it. So onwards to you know what we want to talk about here, some of the some of the trials, um, you know, and some of the inspirations behind them. Uh, we, we we do have a new release, this Trimax system, and uh, don't worry, this won't be a big product uh, push, but just so you know, uh, and and why we're doing the testing that we're doing, or even how it came to be, uh, the triple shoot is just three airways uh, that can send dry product out to out to the drill itself. So you can see on our tank that we use this year. Uh, we actually we, we have three airways and and underneath this allows then any tank to drop into any any airway so we have our two sevens and then the third one is a is a six inch and again three fans on that then so this is this is some capabilities that we were finding uh, were beneficial in our trials and and now we're offering this in our product and now we're expanding on on what the agronomic advantages are with this kind of setup so I did say triple shoot, and so lots of people may have triple shoots, you know, in hydrous, or maybe you're putting down liquid and 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 dry down the same shank. So I guess you have triple shoot. What we're kind of looking at here is more triple placement, I guess. Um, so we have our, our our latest and greatest dual shank opener, uh, the PLDS. So it's got the dual knife. Uh, I know that there's a couple of uh, of seed hawk, seed master guys on on here, so this might look a little bit familiar. Uh, the, the angle is 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 exactly the same to be honest with you it's uh, the, the tack angles um, are going to place that seed and fertilizer the same as 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 the competitor drills and openers out there we just put an, a parallel link onto it and maybe some other options but I won't get into so, all those details uh, right now but what this gave us the ability to do is add our mid-row banders on and anyone who knows Borgo uh, mid-row banding is kind of synonymous with that with that name. So we have our, tr our three placements now. So we can put down our, our bark, a bulk fertilizer, then we have our, our sideband fertilizer, and then we have our seed coming down. So you can see how it looks on the, on the drill itself. This is the drill that we had used on our farm here this year. And uh, it actually tidies up really quite nice. There's lots of hoses, but it's not too bad. Uh, for the trials now uh, on our canola, uh, so just some background detail, May 19th it was seeded, we use an L345 PC, a common, well, uh, fairly common uh, in vigor, or newer I suppose, uh, TSW 5.7 grams. What the biggest thing I want everyone to kind of look at here is the 10 seeds per square foot. That was our target rate, and we use bigger seeds, so it was the 5.6 pounds per acre. Uh, our fertility, 140 pounds of actual N going down, 50 pounds of P, 10 pounds of K, and when it came to sulfur, uh, we actually put it down the year ahead uh, in, in the fall, and we use a, an AMS elemental uh, sulfur. Basically, out of any product I could pull out of the of the tank, I would I would always pull sulfur out, and and with it being some of its elemental, I mean, there's benefits to putting elemental sulfur on top of the ground and not banding it. So. Uh, this is what we did. This was our fertility. Those are 10 seeds per square foot. So the the biggest thing that this triple shoot system kind of allowed us to play with now is, and, and in the past I should say as well, uh, we have an opener, right? A dual knife opener. We have our nitrogen close. When we want to test nitrogen placement, there are some other factors, you know, are we using a different opener, you know, spacings, whatever have you, like it, you, there's other factors, but now all we do is have the banders locked up or we put the banders down and opener stays exactly the same and we just move the nitrogen away, right? So that's what these trials are really focusing on. Just what happens if we move that nitrogen away? So this is all on 12 inch spacing. Uh, to explain the graph here, I'm going to throw a couple at you. Now, they should look fairly similar, but uh, the numbers on the left-hand side, the yield bushels per acre is in the red bars, and the plants per square foot is in the blue bars. Okay, 
Uh, we do have a confidence up here. There's, there's quite a bit of variability when it came to yield. Um, but and that just has to do with it being a little larger scale. Uh, but again, the, it was very, very similar uh, in that way. Uh, our treatments our treatments on the bottom, nitrogen in the mid row, so that was this configuration, and nitrogen in the sideband, right? These were our two configurations. So when you do look at the yields, pretty much the same, uh, to be honest. It was, it was very, very similar. Uh, the big difference, and it's, it's shown up quite a bit, and we'll get into that, is, is the plant stands. Uh, there's a big push for people to uh, really scrutinize germination and, and seeding rates, right? Because we know that's a big cost. So in this case, all we did was move the nitrogen away, um, or in this case, closer on the right-hand side, and we saw a significant drop in, in plant stands. And so we've been testing this actually for uh, a long time, over five years. We do have a we do have a hawk on the farm when we put banders on it, so we're able to to play with that dual knife with banders. And these are some of the some of the plant stands that we were seeing throughout the years. So. Nitrogen in the sidebands in the blue bar, nitrogen in the mid row on the red bar. And again, back in 16, 17, 19, and 20. Um, hey, Cheyenne, yeah, can you, split, can you split that MRB and sideband? Are you meaning nitrogen, wise? Um, yeah, maybe we'll get back to that right away. Uh, as far as plant stands go, uh, when we saw back in 2016, 120 pounds of N we're putting down. We saw a little, we saw about 7% increase in plant stands. Um, 2017 then, 130 pounds of N kind of increased, about 50% greater when we put nitrogen, just moved it away. Uh, 2019, we didn't do it in 2018. Uh, 2019, uh, really, really dry year, um, really dry. The seed we got, uh, we found out later, wasn't good. Uh, really low germination on it. But again, there's a huge difference between these two. Uh, in this case here, uh, and again, in back in 2020, now the sideband versus the mid row, you know, we saw about a 75% increase uh, in, in in plant stands. And I didn't include the, the the yield across any of these because, to be honest with you, um, there wasn't a huge difference out there. Not huge. There, I mean, there was a couple bushels, but I just wanted to kind of focus on the plant stands in this case. Uh, so yeah, going back to Cheyenne, yes, we can split MRB and sideband nitrogen. Uh, we'll be doing those trials actually next year. We'll be playing with that uh, and to kind of expand on this whole triple shoot concept. So thanks. When it when it really comes down to it, though, in plant stands uh, and what we saw was maturity. When you have higher plant stands, uh, you'll have a, a shorter maturity than lower plant stands. So when we look at these two cases here where we had nitrogen in the mid row at 8.6 plants a square foot, and then we had nitrogen in the sideband, and that was down to 4.9. So what we're looking at is this strip here was going into flowering. It was ahead by quite a few days. I would say five at least, right? And we just know that as we have lower plant stands, the plants will just keep branching out, branching out. And so this is what, what typically happens no matter in, in what case, right? If we have lower plant stands, it'll take longer to get to maturity. When I, when I looked at the plants uh, in general, though, when we went in there, uh, you know, this is a, a couple weeks later, nitrogen in the mid-row band, we could see the flowering was done, so it was ahead. Uh, nitrogen in the side band, the flowering was still there. When I pulled out those two plants, and I'm sure everyone here looking at this is thinking, geez, I wish I had, you know, a field full of these plants, right? They look pretty darn good. They're robust and lots of pods, right? This one kind of looks a little bit spindly. So, you know, what's going on? Is there another aspect is the nitrogen too far away, right? And we know that that's always been a, uh, uh, a, uh, call it a, we'll call it a myth and I'll show you why, uh, nitrogen being too far away from the, from the crop. Because when we look at these plants now, uh, if we're using that logic of, you know, if nitrogen's closest, nitrogen's, you know, midway, nitrogen's furthest away, right? That, that's would, that would be the plausible, you know, um, conclusion coming from looking at these plants. But in fact, this is actually our seed rate trial. So what we did here was we had 2.5 seeds, which was about 1.4 pounds. Uh, this is 2.8 pounds, five seeds, and then 10 seeds was our 5.6 pounds. So I just cut it in half, cut it in half. And these were all seeded with the exact same drill. Uh, it was just our, our, it was a 3320, 10 inch space, just single knife openers with mid row banders. 
So the key thing here is that these are all seeded with the exact same drill, exact same fertility, exact same everything. All we did different was just cut the seed rate. And so when we look at this trial now, um, it was, again, all done with the same drill. Uh, red bars are yield and blue bars. We, we looked at the plant stands a little bit uh, more in depth on this. So blue bars, we took at the, uh, the plant stand at that cotyledon three leaf stage. Uh, the green bars we actually took at harvest. So after we uh, swathed, harvested, I went back in and I counted just the stems that were there. Uh, and, and then on the purple, uh, actually what this rating was, and it was subjective, was an unproductive plant. So the stem was there, I counted in the stems, but when I looked at these, these small stems, and I was using a figure about one eighth of an inch thick, right? It, it basically ended up with um, you know, maybe three pods kind of on a plant, pretty spindly plants. So maybe unproductive isn't the, the right word. It was just, it was very, very small plants, but they were there. So they were counted. You know, if you look up in this corner here, the size of the pen, you know, about half the size of a pen the stalk was. So we look at the results. Yield wise, pretty darn similar. And we're going to look here at our plant stands, um, ranging from two to six or seven, right? And about the same yield. So we just know how elastic canola is and what it can do to branch out. Um, what I'm really focused on is when we looked at our low seeding rate, 76%, 76% germination at the low seeding rate. Okay, and it was pretty similar between the start and the end. Uh, when we go to five seeds, so it was about um, 2.8 pounds seeding rate to get, to get five seeds put down, about 72%, and they were actually exactly the same when it came to what I counted early and then the stems afterwards. So no big issue there. What we did notice is, okay, there's some smaller smaller stems starting to, to kind of show up. The plants are, are starting to fight a bit. Uh, when we moved over to the 10 seeds, uh, this is when there was big, big uh, differences as far as germination. We, start, we, we started off lower, and then by the end of the season, there was lower plants there. They just as they were growing, maybe one shaded the other one out and it eventually just went away, right? And we also see the, uh, a higher increase in unproductive plants or, or small plants. So, um, you know, what this is really showing is that when we get too many plants, right, we, we, we start to have some issues. Um, and, th and that's really showing up. We, we have, the, we have uh, shorter maturity when it comes to this but the plants are starting to really fight each other. And you know, that can maybe explain then what we were seeing back here, right? Nitrogen in the mid row, lots of plants, and, and nitrogen in the side band, fewer. Um, and so this is maybe what we're seeing is a little uh, attack almost on, on each individual plant. So in this particular case, right, probably the best thing could have been is that we could have decreased our seeding rate in, in this case, because we, we knew where the risks were when fertilizer was placed. So we could have confidently started to cut our seed rate a bit, uh, knowing that we're not gonna have this kind of uh, attack on each plant then, so. So again, interesting as well is that as we increased, we just naturally decreased our, our survivability. Uh, when it comes to maturity again, uh, the strips might not show up real well on your, on your screens, but 2.5 seeds, it was just starting to go into flower. You can see it a bit, five seeds was you know, a little bit further along and then 10 seeds was almost full flower here. And so again, it just goes to show when we have lower plant stands, it takes longer to get there, right? And that can be a big, big yield uh, issue. Um, this was about six days in the strips, uh, six days difference between swathing this to when I swath this. I just had to wait for the branches to, to catch up. Um, you know, and this is on one part of the field, pretty flat. You bring this over a whole field, I wouldn't doubt that there could have been even longer longer maturity differences here. So uh, quite a big difference if there's a frost looming. I do have a question there, uh, germination or plant establishment success? So I guess, um, you know, you could call this plant establishment establishment success. And there, Corey, that's probably a good point as far as, you know, what made it to the three leaf, what made it to the end of the season, um, establishment might be a better word to, or a better term to use on that. That answers the question there. So yeah, I don't know if there's any other questions that popped up, but uh, again, please do put them in or we can talk afterwards here too. So, oh, good question, Colin. Yeah, moisture conditions at the time of seeding. Forgot to mention that, very, very good. 
very good moisture. We didn't sink through this at this season. Uh, we had moisture in the soil, and then we got a, a decent little rain, kind of about midway, well, a little bit closer to the end of, of May. So really good moisture at the time of of, of seeding. Uh, by the end of the year here, it definitely started to uh, to dry up. Uh, that's for sure. But at time of seeding, good good moisture conditions, ideal, I would say. Good question. Yeah, oh, I'm gonna continue on then with canola and. You know, I promised to talk about nitrogen and phosphorus. So when it comes to these different placements now, um, this was this is what we had kind of showed before was, okay, this is kind of the triple shoot. Seed on its own, phosphorus out in the sideband, you know, nitrogen off to the side. Well, let's take this one step further. Maybe we do need that phosphorus in the seed row. So let's split the phosphorus, right? See what's just moving, keeping the nitrogen off there. Let's put a little bit of phosphorus in the seed row. As well, when we have just the sideband down, right, we lock up those banders. And we'll, we're just using sideband. You know, a, a pretty typical, and you guys may, uh, those who run this system may argue, but I would say probably a common thing is put all the fertilizer down in the sideband. Um, seed on its own yet. You know, this is this is great for, there's some logistical benefits in this. One truck, you can put it all, one blend all down in the sideband. But let's test it. Let, what happens if we put a little bit of starter pea up in the in the seed row with all that, with everything else down in the sideband? So big graph here. Let's break it up a little bit. Um, again, yield is in the red bars. Blue is the, is the plants. Uh, then we have our triple shoot, so nitrogen's in the mid row on the left-hand side, nitrogen in the sideband on the right-hand side. So what we introduced here was, looking at FOSS, I had a 0P, it should be 0PK, um, no FOSS or potassium. And then we had this split where we had the, the little bit of FOSS in the seed row and the rest of the FOSS out in the sideband. And then this one here is the one I had actually showed you before, was, uh, was all the phosphorus out in the, out in the sideband seed on its own. And so what we see as far as yield goes, wasn't a huge, huge benefit or a big increase in yield actually with adding FOSS this year. And that's just in canola. Let's hold that thought till we get to the, to the wheat. And you know why this was, I mean, FOSS can be tricky in, in the year of application, even though we had really low rates. Um, obviously this canola was able to scavenge and, and find some phosphorus. So not a huge, huge difference when we added phosphorus. And when it came to the placements wise, um, again, not a big difference in yield. Maybe a slight bump over here where we didn't put any FOSS in the seed. Um, plant stands in all three, though, pretty consistent. That 86-87% um, establishment, we'll call it. We jump over to the nitrogen in the sideband now. So this is the split over here um, where we put a little bit of FOSS in versus this far one here is all the fertilizer out in the sideband, nothing with the seed. And again, not a huge difference when we added in or when we added phosphorus to the system. Um, the differences between these two, again, weren't that big uh, as far as on the numbers. I think what's really interesting though is when it comes to to the germination, or sorry, to the maturity and to the crop development throughout the season. So what we're looking at, I did a bit of a swap on you here, I apologize, just the way the trials laid out. Uh, nitrogen's in the sideband on this side. These three strips, if you can see that coming through on your screen. And then we have nitrogen in the mid row on these three strips on the right side. So the zero PK, no FOSS, you can see it's a little bit behind where we had this split of, of P in the seed row, the rest out in the sideband with all the nitrogen. Okay, and then we have all the fertilizer out in the sideband. And so what we saw throughout the year was just this one where we had that little bit in the seed row was ahead. It, it got that little bit of a pop up, and the roots got the, the, the canola started to take it up uh, a little bit earlier versus where it was all together in the side band. And, and this is what we kind of refer to as, as hot banding. Um, it really showed up in the wheat, which I'll show you right away. Uh, but in the canola, we can still see, you know, these two are kind of looking similar uh, versus this one where we had a little bit early access. Uh, eventually, you know what, it didn't matter really on the yield, maybe a slight drop here. Uh, maturity was definitely a few days, but there was that, there was that delay for sure. Uh, actually, maturity was probably three days, to be honest with you, by the time this one caught up. Um, when we jump over to the nitrogen in the mid-row band, uh, so zero PK, it didn't matter. 
if it was split between a little bit in the seed row and the sideband, the phosphorus, or if it was just all in the sideband, just because we don't have that nitrogen there around it in the sideband, um, it really negates the the uptake, uh, the, or the, the delay in uptake, I should say, that we saw with nitrogen in the sideband. So, you know, we have other options out there and some trials that we didn't do this year in particular, but I, I wanted to mention uh, was this, was using, you know, just a single knife. And so we, we offer two different single knife. We have a PLS, Paralink single knife, and that one's our, kind of our, the one that's been on the QDA, also known as the QDA, uh, uh, that this system. And then we have the PLX, so the Paralink Extreme. And this one, you know, we're not going to get into the details between the two, um, again, but this is the old, like, XTC opener. The biggest thing is, right, we combine it with mid-row banders and the profile that it makes. So we have a single knife with banders, and it's banders feeding two openers. And with this one now, it creates a little bit different um, um, challenges, I would say, with how much starter phosphorus we can put down. So this is typically what would happen, right? Phosphorus going in the seed row, uh, the bulk of the nitrogen and sulfur going in the mid-row band. But what we played with a lot over the years here was putting phosphorus in the, in the mid-row band as well, pulling some out of the seed row, putting it in the mid-row. So this split between seed row and mid-row. And again, we didn't do it this year, but we've, we've done it for quite a few years in the past. And actually quite a few producers are doing it as well on their farms um, where we tested having no pee and then we put all the phosphorus in the mid row so nothing i would recommend that we can't really say put it all in the mid row i wouldn't say that but we just wanted to test it and and what we saw over the years was basically no yeah no difference in plant stands we always saw a bump in yield when we had phosphorus in the mid row and so what that told us was that there is access to phosphorus in the mid row it's not early in the season by any means it's later on but the crop can use that phosphorus that's put in the mid row and this here what it does is is just allow us to say okay well there's still some you know issues with that but we can actually use it okay great i did compare it to putting all the foss in the in the seed row on this um where i thought i'd see a drop a lower average uh plant stand um because yeah as ran pointed out here what was this what was the opener size uh three quarters of an inch three quarters of an inch opener on all these trials so not a huge huge sbu three quarters of an inch on 10 inch spacing uh good question um so yeah i would have thought i would have dropped down lower but in any case this is what we saw on average um but this split here what it did was always provided maybe a little bit better plant stand um you'll see a slight reduction usually even if you put a little bit of phosphorus in the seed row and that's that's pretty typical um but the yield was up there then and we had that early season uh uptake so this is why we like the 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 split because we can put down lots of phosphorus if guys want um but we don't have to risk putting it all in, into the seed row so you know this is just riskier i think you can you can get away with it and some areas more so than other areas but why risk it when you know in wet years and dry years it'll definitely be safer in wet years it works just as fine uh, when we see this just visually here uh, we had done this good visual in 15 where 0p and that 55p in the mid row right that you're looking at just canola going or in flowering so these ones haven't quite hit flowering yet whereas anything anytime we put any phosphorus in the seed row it was flowering uh, we come back 12 days later and this 0p had Got into flowering, it was almost, it was actually starting to go out already. Uh, it was just deficient in phosphorus. Um, whereas that 55p in the mid row just kept going, right? So we just knew that there's uptake from it. Um, yeah, to answer that one, Brent, have you tried different FOSS products with lower salt index to try to keep all FOSS in the seed row without damaging uh, germination? Or germination damage uh, we have done liquid trials before uh, so we used an ortho we've used just uh, 1034 and then we've compared it with uh, just dry uh, we did that only uh, comparing 15 pounds of actual pea in the in the seed row uh, the three different types uh, we actually didn't find any difference over three years of testing that um, as far as other products like s15 uh, you know uh, what's the other one sorry green well, someone will answer that to me. The, the other FOSS out there. Um, 
we haven't done any with that as of yet. We do have some trials going on with Richardson where we're, where we're looking at that on the smaller scale. Crystal green, thank you. Uh, so yes, we're, we're, we're looking at that. That's a possibility. Um, what's interesting about doing that the stuff is that I don't think a lot of people have really tried to push 1152 lately, like they are now. Like you saw, I can I got away with lots in the seed drill, right? But there's a lot more research being done with say with S15 or or, or Crystal Green, where yeah, whoa, we can get away with quite a bit. And it's like, well, good old 1152 seems to still be hanging in there. Um, so yes, I guess short answer is no, we haven't done any pushing the rates in the seed drill, but we have tried other products. And uh, yeah, if you want to follow up with me on that uh, afterwards, that's that's great. We can discuss that as well. Lots of bars coming at you. Don't really worry about it. It's supposed to impress. Uh, lots of different trials over the years. Um, basically, these different configurations. What we kind of found was the sideband average was about you know 59 bushels an acre. Pretty good. Best parts of the field, so we're not bragging here. Um, 59 bushels an acre. Uh, over three years, 4.6 plants, triple shoot average about 61, so s slightly higher yield, but if that plants per square foot on, on average is getting, we're just getting more plants with that, right? We're moving the nitrogen away, and just like what I showed. Uh, the single knife MRB actually turns out to be some of our highest yielding. Um, we're not moving as much soil, right? There's some benefits to those double shoot openers. Um, but there's some benefits to the to the single knife as well. We think maybe moisture conservation is uh, could potentially play a role in, in yield, but then slightly lower plant stands. So you know when we're looking at this, we're saying you know okay we've got some good plant stands here if that's what we're really interested in, or you know we've still got a good yield, uh, maybe sacrifice some plants. But it all comes down to what you're kind of after on your on your farm. Uh, your view on all fert in the mid row there, James. Uh, yeah, you, it'll get there. You're going to lose out on a little bit of a pop-up effect, and and that's where we don't really recommend that. I would say if we can, just put put a, put a little bit into the into the seed row, um, preferably just you know just like a phosphorus. Uh, we have done some work on on doing a one blend and splitting a little bit in the seed row. We usually end up with that though. What we've played with is a really high concentration of nitrogen, and if you have any sulfur in the seed row boy, it really hurts your plant stand. And I think that's been documented quite a few different places now, and, and that's what we found. So uh, if possible, James, I would probably put just a smidgen in the seed row if, if you can. So we're going to move on from on canola now, just in, uh, to keep it keep it going. And we're going to take a look at some, at some wheat trials that we were doing out here. Uh, so just some details on it. Uh, May 13th seeding date, we used Landmark. So it's a semi-dwarf, uh, hard red. Uh, wheat, TKW uh, 39.6, basically our seeding rate, 150 pounds was getting us about 40 seeds per foot square, so 40 seeds. Our fertility here again, uh, 140 pounds of actual N, 35 pounds of P, 15 pounds of K. Uh, we did put a little bit of granular copper, we actually are a little low. Um, to be honest, we did a trial with this too here this year, and, and this year it didn't really make any difference as far as yield or anything when it came to this granular copper product. Um, but we put it on everything just to kind of cover our basis on it. Uh, and the elemental sulfur was applied, um, it was canola this, or last year I should say, stubble. And, and so the year prior to that, we had applied some elemental sulfur, which you know we'll be getting a little bit of sulfur from, from that into the wheat. So again, the same kind of setup as far as the as far as the trials went. Uh, the nitrogen placement, the sideband, and let's just move that nitrogen away, right? And and what happens? So this we were looking at. Uh, so the yield in red again. The plants are in blue. Green is protein. So we we were taking into uh, consideration protein. Uh, 12 inch spacing. Uh, this was nitrogen in the mid row on the left hand side and nitrogen in the sideband on the right hand side. And this year we saw a, a considerable difference in, in yield. Um, I would say that's not common from what we've seen before by any means, but this year there is a huge difference in, in yield between these two uh, different placements. Plant stands didn't really change neither did protein, but the placements really had an impact on, on yield. And so when we look at that in our trials here, uh, you can see uh, the PK in the sideband with the nitrogen. So this is just everything in the sideband. 
and comparing that to this strip over here, PK in the sideband, nitrogen in the mid row, right? So this was kind of the triple shoot, and this was the everything in the sideband uh, with the with the with the FOSS uh, and seen on its own, I should say. So you can see there's a difference here, and this showed up early on in the season. There's just a delay since the since when the weed started even to come up, and it, it stayed for that delay until the end of the season as as well. Um, and obviously you saw there's a bit of an effect on, on yield. And so, like I said, this year's year, um, so if we just look on to the right side, 2020, uh, this is what I just showed you, uh, this difference in yield. The other years that we've done this though, I wouldn't say we've seen that big of, that big of yield. Uh, we've seen some differences maybe in some plant stands some years. Uh, some years it was exactly the same. Um, so on average, sideband average, you know, about that 73 bushels, 25.9 plants, and this wasn't always putting down 40 plants, so uh, just relative to each other here, uh, 77 bushels and 28 plants a square foot. So you can see there's a little bit of a bump in both, but uh, this year, for whatever reason, it delayed it back enough that maybe it caught different rains or even heat-wise, who knows exactly, but um, definitely a big difference in yield. When it came to phosphorus placement, uh, again, just like what we did in the canola, well, let's let's take this one step further, right? We got nitrogen in the sideband. Let's put a little bit, let's put it all actually in wheat. Let's put it all in the seed row, pull it all out of the sideband, put all the phos. We just know that in cereals in general uh, and wheat, you know, it's a little bit more tolerant to starter fertilizer. So the splitting of it, I mean, you can do it. I haven't really found a big benefit over the years. So we just look at saying, you know what, let's put it all in there. Uh, and, and then compare. On the triple shoot side, again, we had the starter out in the sideband and the seed in the in the seed row, and let's just move it all in. So effectively, we were just dragging a, a knife through the ground off to the side and not putting anything in it when, when we were comparing these two together. So yeah, Colin, again, the target plant stand this year was 40 plants. 40 plants for this year was our target. So when we look at the phosphorus, again, lots lots going on, but we'll break it down. Uh, nitrogen in the mid rows on the left hand side here. Again, yield is in the red, blue is the plant stand, and green is the protein. And so what we saw was a massive difference when it came to phosphorus. I showed you in the in the canola there was yeah there's a little bit of a difference, but not really. Wheat, big response to phosphorus, and. Uh, yeah, to explain that, I'm, I'm, you know, not entirely sure. They're both fields were low in in low in FOSS um, on both sides there, so uh, wheat just was able, maybe not able to scavenge as much as canola uh, in the ground, and uh, it really paid off putting down down FOSS. And so when we look at you know putting all the FOSS in a seed row, when nitrogen is out in the mid row and just kind of dragging that one knife, right? Big difference between the zero PK. Um, but between these two, where we had this kind of the triple shoot versus, you know, non-triple shoot, or, or I should say just putting all the FOSS in the seed row, uh, not a big difference in yield. Maybe a slight decrease when we had a FOSS in the, in the seed row, but not, not significant by any means. When we jump over to the, to, onto the sideband side, again, big difference in, in, in yield when it came to adding phosphorus into the system. Uh, when FOSS went in the seed row, uh, a slight bump in yield here. Uh, you know, again, it comes down to, you know, comparing everything in the sideband. Uh, was there a little bit of a delay of that uptake of phosphorus earlier on, right? And so we see it in a bit in the numbers on this, on, on this scenario over here. Uh, where it really, really showed up, though, is, is honestly in the, in the picture here. So I brought this up, and now I'm going to label the rest of the different strips out here. Nitrogen in the mid rows on the left-hand side. You can tell right away where the no PK strip is here. Uh, PK in the seed row or PK in the in the sideband with this triple shoot, it really didn't matter between the two. Uh, again, you move that nitrogen away, uh, FOSS can get uptake from the from the sideband, no problem. Uh, when nitrogen was in the sideband, however, uh, this is where we see that that big difference again. We sort of saw it in canola, uh, but we really saw it in the in the wheat this year. Where no PK. PK in the sideband with all the nitrogen, this strip here, and we have PK in the seed row. So this is where it was that we could take up that phosphorus uh, because it was right there in the seed row. 
nitrogen was off in the in the sideband, so we, we saw the differences of what happens between it in the sideband or the mid row. But just in this system here, big difference between these two, uh, and and basically that just comes down to access to phosphorus, right? And uh, there's been lots of lots of studies on this uh, throughout the years, way back. Flayton and Racks there in 1985 even showed this hot banding, right? Where it's just nitrogen's converting, not really favorable to root growth. Uh, you have to wait for the nitrogen to dissipate out before the roots can physically get in and go get that phosphorus, uh, being that it's a non non mobile nutrient there. So yeah, so it just ends up you know Bernie's just waiting on that one to come in kind of thing. So I had to throw a little little Bernie and the mittens in there as well. So this is a this is a watch out though for sure. Um, it's it's nice to be able to put everything in the sideband. Uh, logistically understand that, but you you could expect a bit of a delay there. So yeah, and wrapping this up. Um, oh, Travis, good question. 12 inch, yes, that was all in 12 inch. Yeah, that was 12 inch. We're actually going to be playing with a 10 inch drill here, uh, triple shooting this year, but we'll see how that goes. So in summary, canola nit placement of nitrogen, um, sideband really decreased plant stand. Uh, that's that's what we found, and anytime you decrease your plant stand, it just extends maturity, right? And and we saw that from the the seed rate trial as well. We we decrease our plant stand, and it just extends out the, the maturity. So it doesn't really matter how you get to that point. If you have a lower plant stand, you'll have longer maturity. Placement of phosphorus, sideband placement of nitrogen and phos. So this is everything going down the sideband. Uh, it just delays that uptake of phosphorus. And, and we saw that really displayed in the in the in the wheat, but it also shows up in the in the canola as well. So split placement of phos in the seed row and the mid row works well, and we we recommend that. Um, lots of guys are doing that. Lots of people are doing that, uh, and, it, and it does seem to work well if you're trying to up your phosphorus rates in general. Put a little in the seed row, you can top up a bunch more in the mid row, and whatever combination you kind of want to work with that uh, is is up to however. You, you know your risk of, of how much you want to put into the seed row, but there is uptake of floss in the mid row. And on our seeding rate trial, again, the lower seeding rate decreased plant stand, right? You're not putting as much seed, so you're going to get a lower plant stand. Um, but the lower seeding rate of canola also lowered the mortality, right? So you're getting a, a higher percent of establishment if you lower your seeding rate, just based on on that. So that was kind of interesting. And again, anytime you have lower plant stands, it extends maturity. So on wheat, placement of nitrogen, sideband placement of nitrogen significantly decreased yield. And I would say that was, you know, we'll see what happens next year as well. Um, you know, I wouldn't say that's that has been documented throughout the years, but it definitely showed up this year in 2020. Uh, there's uh, definite delay in early season development when nit nitrogen was a little close. And so what can happen there is just, you know, just the roots getting pruned a little bit. Uh, they just, it, it, they literally will will kind of melt the root tips and, and uh, definitely the root hair off those. So it just kind of hurts the plant a bit. Grow through it usually. More moisture will, will help that, but uh, definitely delays it. Uh, placement of phosphorus. Yeah, so phosphorus placement uh, is really hinges on where your nitrogen is placed, right? So in the sideband placement of nitrogen with all the FOSS in the sideband, it delays it. Um, if you have the nitrogen moved away though, like we saw, um, all of a sudden you, get, you can have nice access to, to phosphorus uh, in the sideband. So that's always, um, you know, something to consider. Uh, I've been talking a lot about how, um, you know, triple shooting in one pass, but that could also, you can also consider this as, um, uh, weapons if you're if you're in hydrosing or broadcasting um, you know that's another kind of form of triple shoot so if you put that nitrogen just not in with all the foss you, you could still put the foss in the sideband and have access it's it's all about where that nitrogen's placed uh, relative so it's a function uh, I guess phosphorus placement is a function of where the nitrogen is that was kind of long-winded sorry about that mineral band placement of nitrogen uh, Again, that's just what I've kind of referred to there. So looking ahead, I guess it's always interesting to see, you know, researchers, agronomists, everybody, you know, putting down more and more. 
uh, where that's going really has to come in, in into uh, consideration, where we're putting that nitrogen, right? And I know actually just recently work over in Scott, the research station there, did a trial with, with sideband uh, and, and mid-row and deep band and broadcast and, you know, essentially uh, put, the, put the nitrogen in the ground, doesn't matter what form, and make it a safe distance away from the seed, and that's your lowest risk. Right. And, and, you know, obviously Borgo has made a name kind of on that, um, but it, it's true. Right. And especially as rates increase. And they're being driven higher. You know, we're all trying to push for higher yields. I mean, we got $18 canola out there. Yeah, I'd like to maybe push a little bit harder. Um, so I, I, you know, I can't see it going down too, too much as far as rates. Um, but so, again, it's just it's driving for higher, higher yields. Uh, and, and variable rate technology is also playing a role in, in you know, kind of watching out where all this nitrogen is going, um, because the average could be, let's say, 140, but in some areas of that field, you could get up to 160, 170 pounds of actual N. So, uh, again, you know, when you're trying to push the yields, in, in that sense, well, if you're starting to put that too close, you might actually start to see it work against you, and, that, and this could be a reason why that's happening. So with that, uh, you know, again, if you, if I'll be putting on some more, there's lots more trials that we did in there in, on the Borgo website here, www.borgo.com. If you go over to the, to the agronomy um, tab over here, you'll see all of our, all of our things in, in PDF form. Or feel free to, uh, yeah, contact us here. Uh, you can either call the office, ask for, for Curtis, or here's the email. You can find me on Twitter, obviously, I think, um, we only really sent out this webinar online, so I thought that was kind of neat. Everybody was um, um, definitely, you know, we have a lot of uptake on us here. So you can contact myself or we have Jeff Strukoff as well. And Jeff, um, again, reach him on email or I guess if you ever need help from him, I, I suppose you know how to pay him back just judging by his, his Twitter handle there. Uh, so with that, I, I think, yeah, we can open it up to, to some questions perhaps. Uh, you can either type them in the chat. I'm just gonna go to the chat here. I see I've got a got a few. Um, yeah, uh, appreciate your visuals. Yeah, any plans on extending, expanding testing sites, i.e. Uh, drier, uh, drier, less productive soils? So really good question. Uh, I wish that we could move this this farm around in different areas. Uh, obviously, we we can't really do that. And you know, I've tried working with some you know farmer you know producers in general. You get busy, right? And and so it's hard to do these really detailed trials. I mean, I understand 100%. So uh, we could look at maybe doing some combinations, but. Uh, or, or some or working with other producers, but the problem is that I'm trying to kill some canola sometimes, right? And how does that that one really sit that well with some with some people out that way? Uh, research stations, we are trying to work uh, maybe a little bit more with some research stations, but as far as our larger scale trials, um, unfortunately, we're kind of just land or just locked to to right here. Uh, where we can do these in general. So, no, it's a, it's a good question. It's a good point. Um, you know, obviously in these conditions, this is how it's working in these conditions. So um, you have to take this with a, call a grain of salt as well and try it out though. But, you know, I would suggest if you can try some of these things, uh, you know, maybe just cut off your nitrogen for, uh, you know, just a hundred feet or whatever, right? And just see what it does to your plants then. Go back and take a look. Uh, maybe you can do some of these trials on your own farm, but fortunately, no, we we, we can't really move this around. Uh, what was your reasoning for going to 12-inch spacing in the trials? Uh, so that's just on our triple shoot system. So right now we're only offering triple shoot on 12-inch, on and I think that has a lot to do with just the, the dual knife opener in general. Lots of great things with it, you know, warms up the soil, gets your, gets your starter, gets your seed down, and there's good, good uh, uh, non-mixing, they're close, but they're not mixing uh, with that opener, but it creates issues with trash flow. Uh, trash flow, uh, you know, can be an issue with a dual knife, so as it wraps around, uh, it catches on that back one, and we've seen those beaver huts out there, especially if you've ran one before. Uh, so that was the only reasoning on on 12 inch uh, for the triple shoot. Uh, if you go into our trials, we've actually done some trials in 10 and 12 inch uh, with the single knife. 
So uh, that was only for that one. Uh, has insect pressure ever been a problem in any of your trials, flea beetle and canola? Yeah, we, uh, we sprayed these ones this year. We knew we had some lower plant stands out there with our seed rate trial. And so that's another consideration if you're going to try to decrease your seeding rate or, or, or have lower plant stands. Basically, we saw some flea beetles and we said, yep, we got to go. We got some trials out there with only like two plants, right? And so a square foot. So, yep, you got to you got to go. So that's a that's a good question. That's a good point there, Kate, for sure. Uh, recording the webinar. Yeah, I'm recording it. So I will get it out to you for sure. And then we might even be able to post it on online. So, yeah, you'll have a you have a recording of this. Any data on wider openers? Good question. Uh, SBU will be higher to allow more fertilizer. I've had some requests for this, and I guess it's just it's really going to be dependent on where you where you are. Uh, short answer is no. We haven't done any as of yet. I don't know if any of the actual opener manufacturers have done uh, or have had done testing with that. Uh, you know, basically here at Borgo, we offer just the, we like banders and you can buy the, the opener assembly and then whatever tip you put on, it's, it's kind of up to you. So we haven't honed in on that quite yet. I would say though, you know, in areas where it's more wet, you want some more soil flow, then yeah, you can go wider and it should help you in your SBU. Uh, I don't know when it's going to turn negative on you or what, what year, dryness, location, soil type, um, I guess the short answer is no, we haven't been able to do that, but you, you, it would make sense that that could happen where you use a wider opener to put down more seed placed fertilizer. Uh, anything, thoughts on singulation for cereals? Yeah, um, so obviously we're playing with some singulation here at Borgo. We've got our, we've got our air planter option and uh, I didn't dive into any kind of singulation trials, but in canola anyway. Cereals, I, I guess short answer is uh, it's interesting for sure. Um, we were just talking about the other day, what, you know, what are the options with it? You know, there's hybrid uh, fall rye, let's say, where you're only seeding at about 56 pounds an acre. And, you know, what could that look like? Uh, the thing with cereals is even if you were to space them out perfectly, um, they're, the seed's big enough that if you were to have it bang, 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 um, in the seeding rates that we're using right now, you're basically just be touching each other the whole string. So I I don't know the benefits of, of the cereal singulation as of yet. I could see it maybe playing a bigger role if we move to more hybrids um, in, into the future, per, perhaps. So we're looking at it though, and we'll see at once we get some other of the singulation stuff ironed out if, if we can start to put it in these trials as well. So good question. Uh, okay, have you considered adding uh, further economic analysis, cost of owning, operating a tri versus dual versus other app systems? I, I guess I, I haven't dived into that yet. Um, I mean, the options are, are almost limitless as far as what a guy can do, you know, what's a floater worth or custom app or, or an hydrus. Um, it's, it would be a very, very good study, I would call it, to, to say. Um, you know, and one that... Uh, yeah, I'll just go ask all the TMs here at Borgo. Maybe they they can jump in on that. But uh, I, I think it's a good question. Um, it'll obviously really depend on, again, on individual farm. But uh, I mean, it's a good suggestion. So maybe we'll follow up on on that there. Thank you for that. Uh, with a dual knife setup and MRBs, would you be splitting out some of the end into the sideband or all the end down the mid row? Yeah, so what we're doing with that, uh, we're going to be doing those trials, I guess, coming up here this year, because that's kind of a, okay, we, we've played with where the FOSS is, we kind of know what we, we like that, well, now let's start splitting, taking that nitrogen out of the mid-row, I'm just putting a little bit in the or into the sideband now on the triple shoots kind of system. Uh, Speculation-wise, I in canola, I don't know if it's going to make a big difference. Um, I wouldn't... I wouldn't put a whole lot in the sideband with all your FOSS just because, um, you know, you just got to watch out. You want to make sure that that small root gets there and takes up that FOSS earlier. Um, it's an option. You can do it. Cereals, there might be more of an opportunity there where, you you know, you have a little bit of nitrogen closer. 
indicates to the plant we got nutrients here you know earlier on maybe that'll help uh, in setting up some yield um, it's something that we're going to play with to be honest with you and uh, yeah if you want to try that on your farm a bit there uh, for sure we'll, we'll compare notes here at the end of next season so um, yeah it's an option lots of options out there when it comes to triple shoot a lot of different placements obviously but we're going to continue on, on on trialing it a bit okay well i think we're kind of out of questions here um so with that I, you know what I, I think we can probably shut her down um again uh if anybody would like to follow up feel free to uh, email or find me on twitter or, or, or contact the office there again so uh, yeah if we have any more questions but otherwise thank you so much for attending and uh yeah you guys have a, have a great rest of the day and, and well, i'm sure we'll, we'll talk with you later all right bye now